first to God I'm giving. As the apostles filled Jerusalem with their teaching about Jesus, we are called to bring good news to the world. Our witness is in word and deed, in time and treasure. Give thanks in all things, for God is good. With our gifts we express thanks for God's steadfast love, which endures forever. All the plates are in the same place they've been now for a couple of years. Back to the sea. We can use the Heifer Project often too as a measurement for <laughs> prayer. Thank you, God's great man, for that which you did in this exciting work and this exciting community. Okay, um, Dan is going to be going to be over that. Dan's going to be talking about um, a verse in the Bible from the last chapter in the Bible. It's called Revelation. And he's going to be reading, or Norman is, a lot of verses, but I'm going to concentrate on the last one today. It's from Revelation 1, verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So let's talk for a minute what, about what Alpha and Omega Alpha, these are from Greek, these are from Greek alphabet. Alpha means the beginning, and omega means the end. So in the English alphabet, what's the beginning of the alphabet? A. What's the last letter of the alphabet? Z. Okay? So, we're supposed to try to work through this verse, 
and learn that God, Christ, is the beginning and the end. Now let's think about that. How can a person be a beginning and how can a person be an end to life? What's the beginning of your life? Evan, what is the very first day of your life? Were you big or were you little? You were little. That's right. And we don't know the end of our life. We don't know when that's going to be. But there is a beginning day and there is an end day to our life, right? What Christ wants us to know is he is the beginning, the middle, the end, the almighty, the everlasting, forever. It's a big verse to understand. It's a very big verse to understand. But today, this is what I want you to learn. Alpha, can you say alpha? And omega. Can you say omega? Yep, it's a big word. Alpha and omega. And I want you to be thinking about how is Christ in my life? Where does Christ fit in the beginning? And where does Christ fit in the That's a big concept for you. So we will stop there. Have a prayer with me. God, thank you for this beautiful day and for another chance for different ages to come together and learn about you. We acknowledge that we don't always have the wisdom to discern everything that is written. We ask that you open our hearts and minds and that you go with us as we do the best that we can do as we try to come to an understanding of all that you have to do. Today's scripture, Mary has already called to our attention the last uh, book in the Bible. We'll follow along to so page 25. Revelation, John. Revelation, we're coming from the uh, book of I suppose. It's revealing what's come. Some things that happen. First chapter eight. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood. And made us to be a king, priest, servant, his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wait. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. Who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. That's a blessing.
Risen Savior, as we continue in praise and hopefulness of your resurrection, help us with our brother John to catch the vision of you, to be empowered by the promise of your coming, and equipped to testify to you. To your resurrection and to your promise to come again. These things we pray through Christ Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. One of the great challenges of modern life, characterized by motion pictures, video images, and the abundance of photography is that many of our imaginations have dulled as we have gotten used to others painting the picture for us. Now, I don't know if this is merely the way that I as an individual am horrified, or if it's a consequence of growing up in a world where the picture is often painted for me. But I do not consider myself to be a very imaginative or artistic person. When forced to draw something, usually because my toddler insists upon it, I must confess that I believe if an art critic were to look at the two drawings, one by father and one by toddler, just about any art critic worth their salt would consider her drawings to have a far greater artistic value than mine. I acknowledge these artistic limitations because I believe that some of us can relate to them. Now there are others of us who can't, others who are very artistic in nature, very imaginative, uh, are gifted in that way, but for those whose gifts and talents are not artistic in nature, those who are more mathematically inclined, we bring this challenge with us when we encounter images and visions in the scriptures. Visions by their nature tend to resist the type of logical argumentation and deductive reasoning that those who are mathematically inclined tend to excel in. Instead, visions invite us to see, invite us to imagine, and invite us to enter the world of the visionary with the way that a painter, a poet, or a, or a musician is more able and inclined to do. Rather than telling us who Jesus is or what Jesus is about, these visions in Scripture invite us through hearing and imagination to experience our risen Savior for ourselves. 
And while many books of the Bible contain records of visions that God's people have received, the book of Revelation is rather unique in that the whole book, even the parts that seem to be in the forms of letters or hymns of praise, are the record of a vision. A vision experienced by our brother John on the island of Patmos. With this in mind, it is important for us to remember as biblical scholar E. Schusler Ferrer notes that apocalyptic writings as a whole and revelation in particular persuade not by appealing to our logical factors, but to our imagination and our emotions. John the Revelator invites us to feel, to experience, and to imagine the power of the risen Christ and to allow the emotions that those experiences evoke to lead us through as we encounter his vision of Christ Jesus. <clears throat> John begins with an introduction similar to many other New Testament writers. He introduces himself by saying, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before the throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. While we have the benefit of reading and going back and re-examining what John shared with us, most of John's first hearers would have received these words by someone else reading them to them, by someone else reading them out loud. They would have heard them the way that you did this morning as Brother Ron read them to us. Imagine in a time of great challenge and struggle for yourself and your fellow Christians gathering in someone's home or maybe in a deserted area outside of the city where you live. Probably in secret. Maybe even in the middle of the night to avoid the authorities detecting you. And hearing these words, how do these words strike differently when you hear them? When the images catch your imagination, and I suspect that this would be what it was like, because the images come at you in bullet form, boom, 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 without a whole lot of space to stop dig deeply into. Notice what our brother John does not do in his introduction. In verse 4, he names himself as John. But he does not say which John he is. In verse 9, he adds that he is their brother who shares in their persecution and is on Patmos, a populated island near Ephesus indicating that he likely had to flee from his hometown because of that persecution he has mentioned. From these quick hits, John's claim to authority is the, that he is one of those who are receiving this book, a fellow Christian who is experiencing the same trials that they are and has received a vision from our Savior and our Lord. This introduction is the first sign that we, too, will be invited to experience the vision for ourselves. And in experiencing that vision for ourselves, we will be invited to depend on the authority of the God who brings the vision, rather than upon the authority of the writer who takes it down. In those introductory sentences, John proclaims grace to those receiving his words, but more important than the proclamation of grace and peace is the origin of that grace and peace. In appealing to God as the one who is, who was, who is to come, John is invoking the common rendition in Greek of the divine name given in Exodus chapter 3. In this quick sentence, we who are hearing John are invited to remember that our God is the God of of the present and of the future. 
This memory seared deeply into the soul is especially important when the present is not a particularly comfortable place to be. The God who brings this vision of comfort and hope is the same God who has sustained his promises in the past. And the same God to whom we pray in the words of the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When John gets to the person of Jesus, the titles that he chooses speak directly to the imaginations of those under persecution. In calling Jesus a faithful witness, John is inviting us to imagine ourselves offering a similar faithfulness to that of our Lord, who did not turn aside even when confronted with death on the cross. Rather than attempting to persuade or Joel, John encourages those who are hearing him to remember Jesus and to allow that memory of Christ's faithfulness to lead us on, to spur us on, to encourage and equip us. To a church that had likely seen some of their fellow believers martyr for their faith, reminding them that Jesus was the firstborn of the dead, brings the promise of resurrection into clear focus. When we call Jesus the firstborn of the dead, we are reminded that there are others to follow. When we talk of someone as a firstborn, that means that there are more siblings to come after that. For people who are being hassled and persecuted by the legitimate civil, civil authorities, representatives of Caesar's empire, calling Jesus the ruler of the kings of the earth, reminds them that God's power has humbled the mightiest empires of the world before. And that God not only is able, but God promises that he will do it again. Each of these titles for Jesus communicates an important message to the churches in Asia Minor that is designed to encourage their, <coughs> their trust in God's promises even as they wait upon God's action to deliver them. As John continues, the images fly at those hearing him at an even more rapid pace. He writes, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom and priest serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Like many introductory phrases in biblical letters, we might be tempted to dismiss these words as a simple benediction that serves as a filler until we get to the meat of the letter. But here, this sentence of praise communicates much about who John believes Jesus to be and who John wants the Christians in Asia Minor and every Christian anywhere else who reads or hears his words to put our trust and hope in. Beyond proclaiming Jesus' power, John claims that power through Jesus' love. And John claims it on behalf of everyone who receives his words. He also reminds his fellow Christians of Jesus' actions on their behalf in the past, freeing us from our sins and making us into a people bound together by our shared role as priests serving the living and risen God. We too, brothers and sisters, are heirs of these actions of God in Jesus Christ, called to the same faith and trust as our spiritual ancestors in Asia Minor. And our faith in this time and in this place, our witness in this time and in this place, comes from that same trust in the promises and actions of God on our behalf, as did the faith and witness of those who have gone before us. As John moves from the past into the future, 
He once more beckons us to look with faithful imagination. He writes, look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierce him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wait. So it is to be. Amen. In this appeal to see with eyes of faithful imagination, John is look, inviting us to look beyond the present. Look beyond our immediate circumstances, no matter how wonderful or horrible they might be. And to be built up by a vision of the risen Christ. When we speak of resurrection on Easter Sunday and beyond, we do not say that Christ has risen. We say that Christ is risen. And we say that because risen is the present state of our Savior and Lord. Christ did not raise in an event that is over and done with. Christ is risen in our lives, in this world, and in heaven. And Christ promises to come again. The promise that Jesus will return, that he will be seen not only by those who follow him, but also by those who actively oppose him, beckons us forward. It is this promise that spurns us on, this promise that equips our witness, this promise that empowers us in all times and in all seasons, no matter how good, how bad, or how in between this world is. For it is this promise that gives us a glimpse of the final culmination, a time when the power of God is evident to all, irregardless of their reaction to that power. As we hear these words and encounter this vision of our risen Lord, along with our brother from the island of Patmos all these years later, we too are invited to look upon these images with faithful imagination. We can easily look around us and see the world as it is. We can see the crushing poverty that so many in our local community and around the world live under as a sign of the power of death. <clears throat> we can see this present age where the power, where power and might often crowd out truth and justice and receive that as a sign of the power of death. We can see and understand the experience of so many of our sisters and brothers around the world, where that power of death, sometimes exercised by non-Christians, but often by those who claim the name of Christ, but whose actions are far from it. An exercise of the power of death where the faithful witness of our sisters and brothers leads not only to hard words, but rather to physical violence as a sign of the power of death. But with John the Revelator, along with the prophets and apostles who have gone before us, we are invited not only to see the world as it presently is, but also to look with eyes of faith and imagine the world as the Lord our God, as our risen Savior and as the Holy Spirit, our comforter and guide, intend that world to be. And not only to see it as God intends it to be, but as God promises that one day it indeed will be, when every eye sees our risen Savior, even those who pierce Him. Sisters and brothers, resurrection is not just about one man getting up out of the grave 20 centuries ago. It is about God's vision for all of creation, a vision that we both live into and draw hope from. And so as we go out from this place of worship, as we seek to live as Easter people, let us live with the image of the risen Christ ever in the forefront of our minds, trusting that this faithful imagination, this image painted by our brother John with Patmos, will spur us further into the future that God has prepared for. future that God promises to bring the culmination by the power of our risen Savior. Amen. As we continue in response to that future that God promises us, let us do so with hymn number 164 in the
read favorite hymns of praise, he lives. <laughs> Amen. Go in peace.